My name is Michael Goldberg, and I am a professor uh, teaching entrepreneurship at the Weatherhead School of Management, and also wear another hat where I am the executive director of our new Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship on campus, located normally at Thinkbox, but today at my house, as all things are remote these days. Um, we are thrilled to have a great panel today um, as we celebrate the Weatherhead 100 uh, competition. Um, and we have two former winners, uh, Andy and Chris, joining us today. And, and Eric Keen, who's an awesome alum and, and has been a great uh, mentor and, and leader uh, on campus to so many and so many folks. Um, and the way we'll do today's session, um, we've been fortunate enough uh, over the last year, I was like unfortunate because so many of our things are remote, but we've had really great students um, that have volunteered to moderate a lot of our discussions that we've done both at Weatherhead and out of the Beale Institute. So I asked Marissa Muth, who is about to be a double alum. Um, Marissa graduated from, um, from Case for with her undergraduate degree in the spring and is just finishing up her master's in accountancy and is joining us from Steeler land in Pittsburgh at her house. So Marissa is going to um, run the show today. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So um, please, if you're on Zoom, you can either put a question in the chat for our panelists, raise your Zoom hand, raise your real hand. Um, and we want to make sure that we will hear from as many of you as possible. And if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, just put your question in the comment and then uh, Doug DiGirolamo and I will be sort of jumping back and forth between LinkedIn and we'll make sure that Marissa sees the question. So Andy, Chris and Eric, thank you again for joining us today and Marissa, over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Goldberg, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session today and just welcome everyone and thank you for attending our session. Um, so as Professor Goldberg mentioned, my name is Marissa Muth. I'm a soon, very soon to be graduate of Case for the Masters of Accountancy. And I'm very excited to moderate the session today with our three panelists. We have Chris Adams, CEO of Park Place Technology, Andy Favre, VP of Transaction Advisory at Insight to Profit, and Eric Keene, President of Keene Advisory Group. And today's discussion is going to focus on the impact that the global pandemic has had on businesses and ways in which companies have reacted in order to rise to the challenge. And as Professor Goldberg mentioned, for everyone on Zoom, just please start or continue to put questions in the chat for our panelists. And throughout the session today, I will definitely call on you um, to introduce yourselves and ask your question. So um, before we begin with discussion regarding the pandemic, I wanna give each of our panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves. So if you could provide a brief description of your career path and the background of your company. Um, Chris, do you wanna start? Sure, uh, so I guess career path, I, I am a, a graduate of Case, uh, got an MBA in entrepreneurship. You know, back then it was uh, Richard Osborne and uh, I think that's probably dating me because it's been a while, I think since it's been uh, his program, but uh, that, so I, I did get an MBA case. I've been working for Park Place for 15 years. I started CFO and then worked my way up to COO, president, and now uh, CEO. So it's been a good run. You know, as a company, we provide post-warranty data center maintenance, which means we fix uh, servers and storage equipment and big data centers uh, all over the world. Anything else? Is is that good enough for you? <laughs> no, that's, that's perfect. Uh, Andy, do you want to go and introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, Andy Falver here. I was a 2000 uh, Weatherhead graduate. Uh, I think I was the last class in the old building, so I didn't get the benefits of you know, the, the nice new building and campus. Uh, but I, I started my career uh, with Ernst & Young uh, long ago, uh, now EY and then uh, got more of the bug to be in small companies. I joined a, a company after e &Y called the Fredonia Group and started their consulting practice. And then about five years ago, uh, I joined a, a very interesting company called Insight to Profit. Uh, we help our clients maximize their profitability through pricing technology and implementation of pricing strategies. So, uh, we serve predominantly middle market businesses. Uh, we're based here in Cleveland, Ohio. We've got about 160 employees overall, about 120 in Cleveland. 
When I joined four and a half years ago, there were 52 employees. Now we've got about 160. Uh, so I think it's a, a very interesting story anywhere, but especially uh, in Cleveland and look forward to the panel. Great, thanks. Eric? Sure, sure. Eric Keene, uh, Weatherhead alum from the class of 94, if that, if that dates me even more so than the others. Uh, so uh, Enterprise Hall, Scott Cowan, the whole, the whole shebang there. Uh, out of Weatherhead, I actually worked for McKinsey here in the Cleveland office for a few years and then was recruited by Russell Reynolds to actually participate and work in executive search as compared to being a candidate on one of their searches. And that's where my career pivoted. And after working at Russell Reynolds, founded my own firm, Keen Advisory Group, about 15 plus years ago. Uh, we office in Chicago and in Cleveland. I'm actually in Cleveland today. Uh, a lot of snow. I'd forgotten how much snow. <laughs> uh, we uh, we work with a variety of clients uh, nationally uh, in, in, in uh, multiple uh, industry verticals. Uh, focus a lot on uh, general management, uh, commercial roles, and some uh, shared service functional positions as well. Great, thank you. Thank you guys for all sharing. So let's move on to the main topic, the pandemic. Um, can each of you discuss how the pandemic impacted your business this past year and what challenges you've had to overcome? Um, Andy, do you want to start this time? Sure, sure. Uh, I think that from, from our perspective, the, the pandemic has obviously been the, the story of the year and how I've characterized it is I think thus far there's really been three trimesters of this, really from mid-March on to maybe uh, mid-May was really, holy cow, what's going on? How bad is this going to be? With the first part really being like, you know, September 12th, 2001, where every day you wondered what was going to happen. Uh, and like my fellow panelists were old enough to remember that, a lot of, uh, you know, people in our company have not been through anything like that. I think the average age in our company is about between 26 and 28. Um, so they really haven't seen, you know, downturns in the economy or you know, this type of severe headwind. Uh, so in, in the first you know, two months, it was both you know, taking care of our clients who were really across the board, some that were trying to figure out how they could manage cash, some who actually had uh, a little bit of un, unforeseen tailwind, um, and then others who wanted to continue partnering but under different terms, whether that was payment terms or the nature of the work we were doing with them. So, so that first two months was really quite turbulent uh, for our clients and for us. Uh, and then I would say that there was a bit of stabilization in the, in the summer time frame. Uh, and then where we really kind of bottomed out and start, people started getting their breath and said this was gonna be okay. It's just how long is it going to be? And then I would say in the August time frame, we really started to ramp up and get back to pre-COVID levels in terms of our business and looking at growth again. Um, our, our business is heavily tied, as I mentioned, to middle market companies uh, and about 80 plus percent of our clients are private equity sponsored. Uh, so as such, the M&A activity is a key indicator of what is gonna happen in our business. And as you may or may not know, M&A activity really stopped in mid-March. Um, and has, has subsequently picked up in, in quite a meaningful fashion. Uh, so I would say those are really the, the pieces of the macro part of, of our business. And then you know, I'll, I'll let others chime in, but then there was really the, the part of how you do business. Um, that early on, it was fairly natural for us to pivot to a remote environment. You know, we travel a fair amount for business, so we're used to working remotely out of hotel rooms at Starbucks, at our clients. So being remote was not unusual, but being remote every day and living life in 30 minute increments uh, really is quite different that we, we learned like others have. Um, and that you know offices like this are good for a period of time, but then over time, you just aren't wired like you need to in terms of comfort. And we have a lot of, as I mentioned, younger people who are in apartments with roommates. And so there's just a lot of things you couldn't have foreseen you know, a longer term uh, pandemic and remote work looking like, and just how to take care of each other, make sure that you do some calls when you're walking, because you're sitting all the time. And there's just so many layers of this that I want to let other people jump in, but we're, 
we're still unpacking it right now. In fact, just before this, uh, we were doing a, our, a team yoga session to try and get people engaged and moving around and give, teaching them tools for how to handle, you know, work at home. You know, granted we're eight months into it, um, but we're still learning every day. So I'll pause there and let Eric and Chris jump in because I think there's just so much to this and likely they can offer different perspectives. Sure, I'll I'll, I'll uh, pick it up from there, and I, I think the uh, the categorization that you had, Andy, was was effective, and and I think a lot of folks felt the different stages as well. Perhaps with some gray area around, you know, what what stage are we really in right now? Uh, there's there's we continue to find out uh, or understand what we don't understand about how this is going to play out. Uh, I'll pick up on one of your points, Andy. The, the, uh, as an executive recruiter. Uh, we had already embraced a lot of remote interviewing techniques. Uh, so, you know, to get on a video conference with a potential candidate was not uncommon in our industry. What has happened uh, via the pandemic is I think the, the culture has caught up to the technology and now we're wrestling with that and how that's ultimately. And when I say the culture is caught up to the technology, again, I think the technology and uh, my, my tech folks, please check me on this, but the technology has been here for a while, while uh, widely available, uh, you know, no, necess uh, no hard line uh, dedicated uh, hardware necessary to interact this way. But culturally, we were not there collectively as a, as a business uh, culture. And the pandemic has really forced us into this arena uh, where we, uh, this is becoming normal uh, to interact in this way in, in 30 minute increments. And, and uh, you know, I kind of jokingly, I, I look at our perspective as, uh, as executive recruiters, as evaluators of talent, of, as interviewers. And a, a year and a half ago, if I was conducting a, a video conference and the door opens in the back and, and the six year old comes running through the room or, or Mr. Nibbles jumps on your keyboard and starts playing around in the middle of a call, I'm, I'm steady writing, redlining the resume saying unprofessional, uh, not focused. And, and nowadays, uh, because of the environment in which we work, uh, people are far more forgiving. The culture around this is let's keep it moving. Life has a way of happening, sometimes in the background, sometimes concurrent to your calls. And uh, you know, you've kind of put away the judgment and, and focused on what's really important about the, uh, the conversations and the meetings that you're in. Okay, Eric, I think that's my cue. I'm, I'm uh, third in line here. So, uh, you know, so we're a global service organization. Uh, we've got roughly 2,300 employees. We, we have uh, customer equipment in 150 countries. So. You know, this was a this was uh, not just a U.S. challenge for us, but a, but a global challenge, and, and a good learning experience for me because you learn a lot uh, running a global company about culture too, which is which is interesting. But if I step back, uh, you know, our company we've been through a lot of rounds of private equity, and always through that, they're always excited about the fact that we're perceived as what they would refer to as re recession resistant, meaning. Uh, the equipment we support runs whether there's a recession or not, it doesn't know, right? You still have to run your data centers. So that's a good thing for us, but it doesn't change the fact that the economy is struggling. So, you know, I wouldn't say we, we thrive in a bad economy, but uh, we will grow still this year. It won't be growth like we've had in prior years, but I know there are a lot of companies hurting. So that, that was a good thing for us, uh, but it's still for us was global crisis management. And we do have uh, crisis management group, and they were meeting you know, the first month every day, and then it went to every week, et cetera. Uh, we had to react globally because uh, this, the way this pandemic was being managed, you know, we had field engineers, and they go out to customer sites. And in the U.S., there were different rules in different states, and we also had to make sure they were protected, uh, but also globally. You know, India, for example, we had actually worried about the safety of our employees because the, the authorities would would, they were, there was violence. They would actually, we had to worry about an engineer getting, getting injured going to work, you know, to fix something by the authorities because they, they did things like this. So we, you know, I mentioned this earlier, it was a cultural learning experience and a good one for me. Uh, but we were able to muscle through it like everybody else. You know, the world keeps turning. Uh, so once we got through the crisis management, then we kind of looked inward at our business and how does this affect us? Uh, I've always told this to people, you know, I don't, I didn't get into this to eliminate jobs, you know, having to uh, lay people off terrified me, you know, you get in business to create jobs. That's the goal. And uh, for a while there, I was worried about that. 
we were able to get through it without you know that having happened to us. And that's fortunate because that's not the same as a lot of other industries and, and businesses. So that's a good thing. Uh, then it's worrying about the safety of our employees. So I mentioned we have people that have to go out and see customers. Well, now I'm panicking that I can't get enough N95 masks to protect them, you know, and other PPE equipment, uh, PPP equipment to keep our people safe. You know, and, and you, you've got to sit there and make a decision. Well, do you stay in business and put people at risk? Like everybody in March was terrified. Um, and, we, you know, we had to get through all that. We did. And, and we haven't fortunately had anything serious happen to an employee. So then you start looking at, okay, now we got all that figured out. We got to run a business. You know, we still got to sell. We still got to deliver services. Uh, so we started thinking through, you know, how does this affect the, the, the growth of the business and what, what things should we be doing? Uh, and ultimately, how do you message appropriately in this environment? Because it's a little different than a typical environment. You don't want to come across as crass or inappropriate when you're trying to sell your services to companies that may be struggling, right? Or uh, they still need to run their data centers, but they might be going out of business. How do you, how do you deal with that? So an example, we'd be, we have airlines, we have hotels. Uh, we had to make a lot of accommodations for them payment wise. And I think those things long-term will help us because they'll remember what we did for them in this economy and they'll come back and want to be a, a longer term customer. So I think that's all you know, good. And I can't speak for how others handled that because we were fortunate enough the business was doing well. So we could, uh, we could manage that cash flow issue, but not everybody can do that. So not everybody has that luxury to say, you don't have to pay us for six months. Uh, there are bills, they do need to get paid. So uh, for us, we were fortunate. I don't know that everybody has that situation. Uh, and then I think the last thing is we're a very acquisitive company. You know, Andy mentioned this, uh, M&A. We did have a deal in the pipeline when this hit uh, and we did close that deal in May. That was a small one, but we also had a very large deal in the pipe. Uh, we're roughly a $250 million company. We had a competitor that was uh, about the same size in maintenance and another business. Uh, we were in the process of uh, working through a deal to acquire them when this happened. Uh, that was a different story because you couldn't get financing in March. We needed you know, a lot of uh, financing to get the deal done. Uh, again, the world kind of normalized. People figured out how to live in Corona and we ended up buying our biggest competitor here last month. Uh, and double the size of the company. So, you know, all in all, you know, my learning experience through all this is people adapt. You know, I think ultimately, you know, living in Ohio, for example, no one left the house for two months, then they started allowing you out with masks on and limited uh, access to restaurants and spacing out, et cetera. Well, business is the same way. You know, we figured out how to do business and keep people's jobs uh, while we're keeping them safe. Uh, and I think that's the key. You got to continue to do that because a lot of people are hurting out there. And, uh, and I don't know if there's a trade-off. I've told people this. We had, it was interesting. And I know we had probably a lot of millennials out. I, it's a, there's a dichotomy in how they approach this. Like our people in their 50s was like, just go to work and deal with it. You know, they're not complaining, even though they're the highest at risk employees I have. The millennials were on me like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't really want to go into the office. Uh, you know, it's, it seems dangerous to me. And we had to, you know, man manage through all that, which we did. But the reason we wanted them there, because they're our salespeople and we need to sell to keep the business going. You know, if our engineers are taking risks, then it's, I didn't think it was appropriate for other people to be safe at home if the numbers are, are off. I don't want to have to lay people off. That was the key. So, you know, we had to manage through all that. That wasn't a fun thing to do uh, as a business. It still isn't. I think they're, you know, we're home for the holidays now, but we're coming back in January. So we'll see see if, they're, if I'm still uh, popular with the employees or not. But culture also matters and everybody working remote, you lose culture. You know, culture is big at our company. We're a tech company. We're, you know, try to be trendy and do things and keep people working together. And that's all gone away with this. So, you know, that's another concern I have uh, that we'll have to manage through, I think in the next six months. Good news, I think with vaccines coming, though, we'll probably be able to get people back in the office by, by next summer, I think. So that that's kind of, the, you know, our experience at, at Park Place. Great. Thank you guys, all of you, for sharing um, so much. I did notice a hand got raised. Heidi, did you do you want to ask a question? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, I was going to wait. Actually, it's a little bit of a lighter topic, but I guess I can ask it now if it's appropriate. Um, as far as culture, you know, the holidays, since we're in the holiday season, how are you letting your employees like know that you care? Are you doing holiday parties or how are you handling that this year? 
And Heidi, would you mind introducing yourself just so we I'm know? Sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm Heidi Carrion. I'm actually um, currently with Sure Tape Technologies, known locally as the Duct Tape Company. I'm in Avon, Ohio, and I am a 2006 grad um, from Weatherhead. Great. Thanks, Heidi. No problem. Yeah, I think that the, that's a good question on the culture. Uh, we probably like maybe like the other folks on the line. We we do uh, an employee NPS score on a quarterly basis, just an ENPS. Um, and we've been fortunate that it's stayed steady through this. Um, and, I, and I've heard, you know, as you look at you know other organizations and even some of the sports teams, you know, those who've done best in this are those with strong cultures, not surprisingly. And like I think Eric and Chris both described, uh, Insight to Profit, I think has a very strong culture. Um, and that's one of the things that we really didn't predict in advance, where it takes just a lot of energy to stay engaged with folks that you normally would have been traveling with, that you would have seen, and now you don't. So that you have to make that time to, you know, early on it was easy with quarantine challenges, happy hours, everyone was really excited. Then it got really tiring, honestly. It was just one more thing you had to do. It's six o'clock on a Tuesday is have drinks with people um, where you, you, know, you were working all the time. And so I think that we've been more thoughtful now to try and layer those throughout the day um, with you know coffee check-ins and, and that kind of thing. In terms of you know holiday, um, we are you're trying to be very mindful both with groups within the company, with the company at large, and even with our clients in terms of how we recognize them, um, in terms of you know gifts and gratitude. Uh, and I think have taken a, a, a thoughtful approach, but it's it's different because we're not doing in-person events largely. Uh, at, at this stage, uh, so we are doing you know more things where we're having uh, lunches, dinners, you know, cooking events together. Uh, probably all the different clever things you've heard about you know throughout. I mentioned the the yoga session we just did uh, uh, this morning um, to make sure that people are recognized, as well as creating forums for people to get together because you know it's not just the pandemic. There's been a lot of other things that have gone on you know, this year as well, whether it's related to the election or, you know, different types of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion topics that are, are, are key on people's minds. There's just a lot going on, and you have to spend a lot of time to make sure that there's forums for those things. So I think the, the long-winded way is, you know, we think we're doing the right things and creating those environments and connections um, but, but certainly it, it's something that um, you know, takes time and thoughtfulness to make sure that you're hitting the mark. Um, kind of just going off on that a little bit, you guys were all mentioning culture and kind of just, you know, another major focus besides the pandemic of this year was the social justice movement. And so, Andy, you were kind of hinting in this and have that, has that prompted like any of you to take a fresh look at how your organization is supporting diversity and inclusion? Yeah, uh, certainly, but I'd like, if anyone else wants to jump in, I don't want to take all the time. We have, you know, I would say that it was something that we did before this, but I would say that it was a, a secondary or just part of the, what we would say was a fabric, but we were not as direct, and we've become much more direct in terms of, you know, training for how to do interviews, with being more direct with what our objectives are and how we measure our social impact that historically it's been very philanthropic, uh, but I don't think it's it's been you know, probably um, more single-threaded, whereas now we have done more grassroots as well as top-down uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives within the company. Um, but I would say that we are still in the very early part of that journey. Yeah, you know, we, we also you know have a history of focusing on these things uh, you know, example would be being in tech. Uh, there's a disparity between uh, men and women in a lot of these jobs. And for years, you know, we were trying to get equity there uh, and struggling. So what we ended up doing was creating a STEM program for women, women only. And it starts at a very young age. You know, if you do research on this, you got to get people young uh, in, in all topics. You know, honestly, I'm on a board of a, a local church, charter system called Breaker Schools. It's the same thing. You get these kids at a very young age and you talk about college from the kindergarten on up. So I want to do the same thing because I love tech and, you know, I got two daughters. I can't talk them into it. It makes me crazy. They roll their eyes at me. 
So, you know, we started with just talking to kids at a young age and then all the way on up through college, we actually sponsor uh, foreign exchange students from Ireland to come over uh, twice a year, although t two students a year this year, we had a, fortunately we couldn't do it. Uh, but it was, you know, kind of like Andy said, it was in different areas of the business. You know, you would react to business conditions uh, through this whole journey. The country has been on this summer. A lot of employees wanted to more organization around it. And they started a, a group, a, a, a employee resource group called Dimensions. And so when, when they wanted to do this, you know, my conversation was, you know, I'll do it, but I don't, it's not for everybody's in a room and just talking about their feelings. You know, I run a company. And I want it to impact the business. So what I want is a group that helps me find uh, diverse candidates to do a better job at that. Cause you know, in areas we, we struggle, you know, in all the way on up, you know, Eric runs a recruiting firm. I I've recruited for some senior executive positions. And every time I sit down, I say, I'm not going to close out my process till I get the right diversity and the candidate flow. We're paying you a ton of money to do this, you know, so do it right. And it all, I always struggle with it still, and it's aggravating, you know. Uh, you know, I would say as a tech company, we've done fairly well at this, but it, it's not good enough. So uh, I asked the employees now, help us with this, right? So this group, that's part of their job, finding diverse candidates. They're not interviewing, Andy mentioned this, but unconscious bias is, is always an issue when you interview. It, it's, it permeates everything, you know, every individual, everybody on this call has unconscious bias. And teaching people to recognize it when you're talking to a candidate makes us better because you want the best candidates always. No, that's not the package. It's usually what's in the package. I look for that. Uh, and then how employees experience goes is at, at the company. You know, I always tell people uh, if the best person is afraid to talk because of how they look or their orientation in any, any way we fail because that doesn't make us better as a company. It doesn't protect all of our jobs. The competitors will catch you. And diversity is a very good thing because it's diversity of thought and experience for capitalism. You want to have, uh, you know, a wide range of perspectives when you're marketing to people or else you want to do a good job of that. So it's very important, in my opinion, you know, for, for a business uh, and for getting the social justice. If you want to be a good business, you need to have this. You look around at a meeting, everybody looks like you in the meeting. You're not going to come out with the best solution, you know, in my opinion. So for us, it's, you know, for me personally, it's always been important. Uh, you know, having said that, you're not going to see me out there lecturing everybody in the world. I, I keep, you know, I, my job is to run a company well and to make sure that we treat people with dignity and respect. So that's kind of where I focus and you know, other people have their opinions, but uh, I, I'm not going to, I, I, I kind of stay out of the public piece of it. I want to run a good company. I want people to be proud to work for us. So uh, that's kind of what we've done. And it was pretty cool that they came up with the name Dimensions. I, I like that. I thought it was a really good name for this resource group. Um, but it's, you know, it's going well. I, I, I would like to still see more diverse candidates. We've got a couple executive openings. And, you know, I'm not seeing what I like, even with the group, even with the recruiting firms, even with the pressure in the business. And I'll honestly hate bidding this, but part of it is it's hard to get people to move to Cleveland. I'm struggling there. You know, if I, if I didn't do that, we would maybe have better success here. But someone asked about culture. All of our employees are here. So culture is important to me that people are here. I, I just feel maybe I'm old school, but when everybody's in a room working together, you know, I might have to change that to solve this problem. Uh, but that's kind of what, what we've done on the topic. Yeah, one other thing too to add is, is this is interesting because we're global. You know, America just, we're so consumed with ourselves. We don't kind of look at the rest of the world, but... This problem is all over the world in different contexts, you know. So as an example, we have employees in Malaysia and there's a whole caste system, Malaysia and Singapore, you know, where people treat people differently. Indians, Chinese, indigenous Malaysian people, there's like a pecking order and they treat people, they do this, they do, it's, it feels much worse to me there because it's overt and they treat people differently. So we have to address it, not just in the US, we have got these groups all over the world and they're trying to look in in their own communities to do a better job of this because uh, it can be a universal challenge. Well, Chris, it, look, there's nothing wrong with being old school <laughs> and, and, and wanting people to, 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 uh, to, to leverage and find power and energy around having everyone in the same place and, 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 and being able to, to work off of that. These, these are ongoing challenges and I think you have to remind yourself that uh, it, it is a journey. Uh, there's, there's a, at no point 
does any organization or company stop that process and say, we've won, we've figured it out. You know, it's just, it's not that kind of endeavor. It is part of doing business. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, at my firm and, and you talk about the culture components of this, our scale is fundamentally different than, than Andy and Chris's. Uh, you know, so there's a level of intimacy in terms of, of my work with my employees, uh, you know, who are, uh, you know, again, you know, a more limited number. Uh, but, we, you know, we operate in a both and type of environment and, and have done so prior to the elevation of the social justice discussion uh, of the past year. And yeah, I think, Andy, you touched upon, you know, there, there's, it's such a multivariate analysis, right? Uh, you know, between COVID, between the election, between the social justice issues, there's just so many things to unpack right now. And, uh, you know, I, I think staying true to, you know, where you feel you are as an organization, as a culture is, is very important in terms of, uh, of being able to maintain and, and, uh, and continue on. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are business people running businesses. Uh, that doesn't preclude us from these activities, uh, but it does create a lens in terms of how we view the world. Uh, but I, I've always encouraged and, and advocated uh, a, a both and perspective on that. And uh, I learned that from actually uh, Dr. Marilyn Mobley uh, at, at Case. She was, she was the first person to really articulate that to me uh, in a way that resonated. And, uh, and we flag flagrantly borrowed that and, and continue to do so uh, in conversations on this topic. All right. Um, thank you guys all for sharing. Um, this is so important. Um, I think Emily has a question. Okay. Hi, I was thinking of a question. I didn't mean to raise my hand if that's something I did. Oh, oh, we, raised, oh we raised it for you. Um, I guess one thing that's very interesting, considering that you're all case alum, is what do you think the focus of your MBA programs were? And how do you, what was the most impactful takeaway that you guys got from your Case Western experience? Well, I mean, I guess I could go. I think, you know, uh, it depends what you want your career to be. When people ask these questions to me, I always kind of ask, well, what is your last job? What do you what do you aspire to be at the apex of your career? And then I think you can work backwards, you know, on, on the takeaways. I mean, for me, uh, you know, I kind of knew where I wanted to go in a career and I was competitive. So it was, uh, you know, education is good, but education is good at Cleveland State, at Baldwin Wallace, John Carroll. But Case has a pedigree to it that, that's unique in Cleveland. You know, it, it is... It, you know, it does stand out on a resume, in my opinion. And I think that helped me personally earlier in my career when there was less on a resume to say, you know, look at this candidate versus another person. Uh, when you're particular, if you're willing to go and fund your own MBA, because I, I did it, I just paid it off a few years ago as a middle-aged, late middle-aged bad, it's not cheap. Uh, I think it says something to employers when, when you, you know, kind of go to that extra step. Uh, so I, I, there's a lot, you know, the, again, the education is also very valuable, but I think it did stand out from a pedigree perspective uh, on the resume. I think Chris is right. It depends on, on what you want. I, I think, you know, certainly in, in my experience is, you know, in our businesses, you know, data analytics, data science, but human interaction still is very important for selling anything in terms of getting commitment from your teams internally or from you know, changing behaviors of our clients. So all of the, the human elements of an MBA or, or other programs uh, should be you know, given, given appropriate attention because ultimately that is, is how a lot of major change happens. And you know, Chris and Eric have both talked about it within their organizations, within their customer organizations, is that just a key piece to everything in creating culture as well as uh, creating change and driving growth, you know, really is, is around the, the human piece of all of this. Trying to unmute here, my apologies. Uh, in, in terms of the, the, the Weatherhead MBA, uh, and, and, and I've had a lot of back and forth, you know, throughout my career on this, in part because I ended up as an executive recruiter. So I'm looking at resumes and evaluating talent but also as I came out of the MBA program, I, I was knock wood fortunate enough to work for McKinsey and McKinsey had not targeted Weatherhead or Case as a, as a primary recruiting uh, uh, location. Uh, 
and, and that priority has, has changed and, and hopefully evolved for the better over the past 15, 20 years. But it, was, it wasn't a priority school, uh, you know, when I was coming through. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to join up with the firm. And I actually had a classmate, uh, Eric Rogner, uh, who also joined the firm uh, concurrent with me. So that was, that was a big deal at the time. Uh, in looking at Weatherhead, uh, I, I think as even, you know, as, as a younger alum and talking to potential uh, Weatherhead attendees, uh, the questions that we tended to put forth were, what do you expect from an MBA program? And, and I think uh, Chris had alluded to this. Uh, there is clearly a regional component to it. If you're going to be in Northeastern Ohio, uh, Weatherhead case has, you know, a, a certain level of cachet that, that definitely resume, resonates throughout the, uh, the corporate culture uh, throughout, uh, throughout the area. If you start speaking about it more nationally, then there are some trade-offs. And if, if your expectation of an MBA program is for you to show up and the brand name alone carries you off to opportunities, then you might have to reevaluate what, uh, you know, what you want to get out of your experience at Weatherhead. Weatherhead was a place where you had to hustle, uh, where you really had to go after opportunities and it wasn't always resident within Northeastern Ohio, uh, to, you know, for, for those avenues, for those pathways. Uh, we were, you know, I'm thinking about my cohort, my class, and we were very creative in terms of getting out to other locations, uh, officially or unofficially, <laughs> in terms of looking for opportunities and, and making sure that, you know, we took the Weatherhead brand with us. Uh, but what we knew succinctly, uh, and we shared with prospective uh, students that uh, showing up is is not the, is not uh, the, the victory lap uh, here. You know you have to show up and you have to do work. And you know from an academic standpoint, you're going to have a tremendous exposure to world class uh, 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 instruction. Uh, but there's a hustle component to it as well, Emily. Eric, you laid a good foundation. We had five go to McKinsey in our class six years later. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow, and thanks, thanks Emily for your question. Um, it looks like we have another question from Paul. Um, Paul, would you mind introducing yourself and asking your question? Sure, Paul Stupe, uh, company is Grow Logic, based here in Cleveland and uh, classmate of Eric, so nice to see Eric. Um, so, uh, but my question is, uh, I, I mean, I, uh, Chris, you, you kind of alluded to this with regard to the different industries, uh, you know, that are affected. I myself, you know, have seen my clients' stock prices, some of them are at their all-time high and some are at their all-time low. So it sort of raises that question, do you shy away from either industries or companies that are going through one aspect of a, you know, a particular cycle, or do you push your teams to sort of stay focused on everyone, not knowing what the 2021 looks like, and you don't want to miss that rebound? You know, I, I think for us, uh, because of what we do, if, if a company is going to be in business, they kind of need us. And we always have leverage. You know, if we stop providing service, that's a really uh, difficult situation for someone to be in. They can't, in our industry, you call it running naked. You can't run naked on mission critical uh, data center gear. And that means they do it themselves. That's a hard thing to do. So uh, because of that, our people, there is nobody we've shied away from uh, unless they are difficult. You know, if somebody has is asking you to make allowances or then they're difficult, you may not do business with them. It's very infrequent for us. Uh, so we've kind of been supporting everybody. Again, we, we this year... Uh, Delta is a new big customer. Delta Airlines is an example. We grew our Marriott business uh, quite a bit. You know, just in general in retail, we have 17,500 customers. So we've got in that portfolio exposure. I've seen very little in the way of bankruptcies. Uh, a couple of the big retailers, geez, it's, I'm drawing a blank now, but names you would know. Uh, a couple of them had restructuring uh, bankruptcies where you know, we did lose some of our receivables but no, I wouldn't say that we've been shying away. We also pay our salespeople 100% variably. So it's hard to tell them don't sell. They, they don't, that doesn't compute the salespeople. So, you know, you kind of got to work with them. And then globally, I don't think we've seen anything. I think in your question, you were also asking maybe if there's anything globally. Uh, I haven't seen anything in other parts of the world either. You know, it kind of seems to be a, 
human beings seem to be very consistent globally. They are all kind of doing the same stuff in their own parts of the world uh, to, sur to survive through this. And the same industries seem to be hurt in the same parts of the world, in my experience so far. Yeah, I think it just depends, depending on the industry. Um, the, the Chris, Chris's services do seem more pervasive and a little bit more recession proof, so to speak. I think depending on the industry, the nature of the conversation can change because you don't want to appear tone deaf, but you may be able to serve them in a different way or under a different structure, or you know they may be so internally focused that it's just not the right time and, and you want to avoid you know pushing something up a hill that doesn't have the right timing, you know, especially in our business, again, as we're working predominantly with private equity sponsored businesses, that if, you know, they're working on so many initiatives, uh, if this is not the right time to talk to us, then, then we should be mindful and see if there's an alternate solution. And if there's not, then we should take a step back and find the right time. But I think, I think it was Chris alluded to is we've also found that we've made a lot of friends for life uh, from how we've worked with clients over the course of the last eight months in both changing some of you know, the terms and conditions uh, because we have a very you know, strong balance sheet and can do that. But we've also pivoted where, hey, having a conversation with a customer about pricing may not be right, but we may be able to help them with inventory or with their own cash collections. But the profitability was not as important earlier this year as cash collection was. And so pivoting that conversation, being a little bit gritty and creative is, I think, go, goes a very long way, especially in this environment. You know, our, just a, a quick take on that, you know, a lot of, and I think, you know, Andy and, and Chris allude to this informally, uh, we work across a wide spectrum of industries and, you know, it, it, I don't know that we had the leisure of sitting there to, uh, or being able to arbitrarily say, we're going to spend more time or index heavier into one side or the other. W what I did find is that we became a backdoor conduit of information for our clients. So we were constantly being asked, you know, from clients in different geographies, in different industries, hey, Eric, what, what are they doing? Are, are, you know, are, are they interviewing all the way to hire remotely? Or are they having people on premise? Or is it a blend? And the, 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 the range of answers on that, you know, you end up being, you know, of consul or consigliori to your clients about, hey, here are the trade-offs and here's what we're seeing. And some companies, because of their jurisdiction, their geography, their industry, you know, have this approach and it's not necessarily right or wrong, but there are trade-offs to that approach. And just being a, an additional data point for the clients, I think has been something that, that we've learned a lot from and, and create a level of int intimacy and trust with, with a lot of them throughout, throughout this uh, endeavor. Great, thanks. thanks for all answering that. Thanks, Paul, for the question. Um, Professor Goldberg, you said you had- Sure, you I'll ask a quick question. Um, I guess nothing's quick in these things because uh, there's always, interesting opportunities to, to explore. Chris, I wanted to riff off something that you um, mentioned in terms of, as you think about hiring and building teams and perhaps how going forward, I mean, you put a premium on having folks with you here in Cleveland, although you have a, um, folks that aren't here, but you know, I guess as we um, think about the impact of the pandemic and how things may change for us going forward, are you gonna think about remote work differently and, and building teams differently, potentially coming out of this, given how you've been able to work or where challenges have been with, with teams? Well, unfortunately, if I want to hire people like Marissa, I probably have to uh, consider that. You know, I, I again, I, everybody has their opinion. Mine is after managing people for a long time, and now particularly large groups, uh, when you have a good culture and everybody's in it and they're at work and they're working together, uh, they just are more effective at solving problems, at having pride in what they do, at working together, at collaborating, uh, which is key. You know, I don't think collaboration is all that effective remotely. And what I mean by that, the tools are great. You, know, you can get a hold of people, you click on it, they, their, their image pops up. But it's when you have disagreements that it doesn't work so well, in my, in my opinion. What they do is they click off of who they're talking to and they click on someone else and start, start complaining as opposed to sitting in a room and figuring it out because that's human beings. You have to do that. That's what makes us better. When you get to the other side of that, 
uh, that's that's where you get real success and collaboration, in my opinion. And so that's why I always push people to be together. Even things like hallway talk. People walk down the hall, whether it's you know whatever show they're watching. I guess the Crown's big now, you know, and just building relationships. Or there's a problem, and they happen to remember it as they cross paths with somebody and talk and solve it, or they walk down the hall and get the other person. Now, I know I'm old fashioned to say that, or old school, and uh, you know, every other aspect of our business, I think, would be pretty hip. But in that regard, you know, I've lost good talent because of it. Uh, but you know, everybody, you know, it's it's my choice at the end of the day. I have to make the choice. I think it's the best for the company. And the trade off to me is uh, the cultural impact of having a massive remote workforce isn't worth the trade off of what I lose for it. Now, I'm going to pivot a little though to say. It's going to be really hard for me to come back after, you know, putting everybody remote globally. Uh, and I would say of our workforce, half to two thirds is in offices. And then say, nope, you have to be back to work five days a week, full time. You know, so I think I'm going to have to compromise here and come up with something that will allow people to have some level of remote uh, work because the world's changing. And, you know, if you don't learn to change with it, someone else will be, we'll be talking to some other person a year from now when you do the follow-up to this meeting. So that's my take. I won't love it, but I think I'm going to have to compromise and work something out. Um, so again, see, like if you notice Marissa shook her head when I said that, because I think she, people like in that generation are thinking that's something that's important to us. Uh, so you, you know, you got to adapt and you have to listen to your constituency there. So that's my reluctant answer. I guess I'm probably going to have to give a little here and work something out with the people. Chris, I, I would let me let me jump in momentarily here, uh, it, even at the junior level, but definitely as you get higher up in your organization, nine times out of 10, when things don't work out, it's not because of technical capabilities or functional capabilities. It's usually a cultural issue when when you have to let someone go or go you know, take a different path. And you know all of those inputs into is the culture right? Is the fit right? You know, yeah, you, you there's good reason why this is of concern to you. <laughs> at the end of the day, yeah, I think that you know even pre-pandemic, you know, we we've been negotiating this this topic, and historically we've had you know Chris's point of view that our work is highly collaborative, whether it's internal or with clients. So on-premise is is the bias. I think the toothpaste is a little bit out of the tube with the pandemic and people working remotely. And we've had some folks, especially folks who live in metropolitan areas like downtown Chicago and they're living there, but they don't get the benefit of it. So they've said, hey, I'm gonna go move to Nashville, Tennessee, or I'm gonna move to Tampa. And we've had a couple of those. Um, and I think there's gonna be more of that. I, I don't I see a crystal ball of how it ultimately changes in the longer term but there's certainly gonna be some of that. And I think that's gonna be okay, but we're still gonna have people coming into the office, even if they're living in Nashville for you know, periods of time. It also will diversify our talent pool. Uh, we are heavily indexed to Cleveland. We opened a Chicago office about seven years ago for talent reasons and it's served us well. But as we, we now have you know someone in Denver, we've got someone in Nashville, we've got a couple of folks in Boston um, and pre-pandemic, they were coming into Cleveland and I think that'll continue. But I, I think that we've got to figure out the balance of, of being in office all the time uh, and being remote so that we still get the culture and we still get the productivity of collaboration, which you know technology helps, but it's definitely not the same. You know, and I can give you, so that's here, this is this cultural thing, but now I've got a lot of people in London and a lot of those people are the same uh, constituency of millennials. They yeah. want to go in the office. They don't want to work from home. You know, in London, you get a postage stamp for an apartment. So if you're in quarantine, that's not fun. They, they want to be out. That city is meant to be enjoyed outside your apartment, not in your apartment. So, you know, yeah. culture matters. Singapore is the same way. Matter of fact, Singapore has never really closed down. We've got location there. Uh, they've never really closed down. And they're a very densely populated city. You know, they've got some protocols there. Uh, but I think it also matters where you where you are in the world. And, you know, just in general, given this is, you know, a, a 
not business students. I tell you, in culture is so important when you when you build and run a business. Uh, if people come to work because they have to, you'll never be as successful as if they come to work because they want to. And finding ways to do that, you know, Heidi was talking about uh, the Christmas party and that kind of thing. I always pay attention to those things because it matters to people. You, you know, it's not all about growing the top line. It's about doing little things that are empathetic, thoughtful, and compassionate. That lasts, you know, making sure you just say thank you all the time to people. Uh, and by the way, Heidi, we're, we this year aren't doing Christmas parties. What we're going to do is donate to food shelters because we just thought the messaging this year, you know, uh, instead of spending money on that kind of thing, we we're going to send out drink tickets around the world and let everybody have a social hour or so, you know, a drink hour. But we elected to donate to, to food shelters around the world instead. So yeah, I think you asked that question earlier. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, because I thought it would be a better message. But just as, as if you're learning, you know, culture is so critical to being successful at business. People work better. You can, you can be the highest payer out there. But if you never say thank you, you'll never get the best out of people. But if you just make them feel good, if you notice that little thing they did, you know, you write a handwritten note, you know, to somebody who didn't even realize that you knew they were an employee, you know, you, you the results you get are, are, are massive. So you know, on this topic, I think it's more of a cultural discussion in general, but whether it's, uh, you know, a lot of the things you guys have brought up today are around culture, you know, diversity and, and inclusion is around culture. Uh, how you handle the pandemic, you know, is around culture. How you handle a Christmas party is all that's about culture. How you manage your career, you know, that's, you know, NPS scores internally, that's all about culture, all of it. It's about making people you know, because everybody's an individual, making sure that you recognize them, not just as part of the population, but as individuals, because they're going to go a lot, work a lot harder, you know, when you do that. So, sorry to get on a bad wagon on that, but you, 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 if, if you're a young MBA student, that's something that they don't teach you in school, uh, but it is critical, particularly if you want to be a good leader. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's along the organizational behavior, whatever you want to call it, and as you kind of sleep through some of those classes, you don't realize that culture really is important and how you do make employees feel and that everyone's going to work hard, but it's a lot more fun and you'll get more out of people if they enjoy the journey as well. So to the extent that you can do that, it takes time and thought and energy to do that. Um, but I think the, the great organizations do make that kind of time and leadership teams have those conversations about the handwritten notes that Chris described that, you know, this year, that's what we're sending out to our employees is, handwritten notes from the, the leadership team member that that you work with. So just to be as mindful as you can, especially in times like this, because there is so much white space in relationships where it used to be in the hallway, it used to be in meetings, now, now it's in Zoom, so you don't know what's around someone and you have to fill that with communication. Well, this kind of, we, we only have a few more minutes left. And again, just thank you to all three of you for participating and just for everyone for answering questions. And my last question was just what advice do you have for college students or young college graduates who may be starting their careers, you know, in a challenging or all virtual environment? And you guys were kind of already talking about that, but do you have any final thoughts that you would like to give? Eric, you're probably the best one to start. <laughs> well, again, for, for recent grads or, or young alums, and again, the, the COVID skews a lot of the decision making and, and perhaps some of the options that are available. Uh, but I, in looking back, uh, you should be unafraid to go anywhere early in your career. Uh, I, I think a lot of folks, you know, in their 20s, uh, for instance, uh, over indexed large cities, I want to be in New York, I want to be in Chicago, I want to be in Atlanta. And you look around and, and, and see the people who over time are often quite successful. Uh, they've developed a, a resilience of not necessarily being in the, in the sexiest city at the sexiest time and, and learn how to work through that. I think the, the folks that you meet from GE historically are a wonderful representation of that. GE had so many facilities in, in a lot of backwater locations and uh, you know, people ended up thinking they got the short straw because they had to go out to, uh, you know, somewhere in Iowa for, for a three year stint. But that experience, uh, they, they relied upon you to do everything. You learned so much so that when you did come back to a, a larger city, back to corporate, uh, you know, it was very transferable uh, to uh, uh, to project uh, leadership capabilities and, and effectiveness as, as a manager. 
Yeah, one thing I, I would just say, especially in the current environment, is is that I think people have become much more human. Um, and as I think it was Eric talked about, the hearing a dog barking in the background or kids coming and asking questions during a conference call are no longer taboo. I think similarly, people, especially executives, are more accessible. And as a young new hire, is I would you know, be respectful, but be aggressive about getting on people's calendars and meeting people in Zoom meetings, or if you get back into the office to create those relationships, uh, because I think people are more accessible than they have been historically. And that will go a long way into creating a, a foundation for you within whatever organization uh, you land and will we'll treat you well, both in your early days, as well as the kind of relationships that will be your network longer term. Uh, I think the only thing I could add again, is given you know where you are in your career uh, and having you know run a business and hired thousands of people probably at this point, that uh, the world is very unfair. No one's going to owe you anything. And all you can do to get ahead is work harder than the next person. So that goes back to where you want to go. Uh, as I tell people all the time, it's not for me to decide what people want or what's a successful career. You know, I have people who just want to be able to get home, have a good job, and then coach their kids. Oh, we may, we, we we may have lost Chris. Um, well, let me jump in um, as, uh, as, as we sort of wrap up. Um, Marissa, let me thank you for, for moderating the panel. Um, and Andy, Chris, and, and Eric, it's great. Great conversation. I know we'd all rather be together at Weatherhead 100 in our um, black tie celebrating the winners this year, but because 2020 and 2021 are what they are, um, this will have to suffice, but we do look forward to getting back together. Oh, do we lose Chris altogether? Okay. So uh, Chris Sr., thank Chris for <laughs> joining. It's sorry we didn't get to your question. Um, I did post a little bit more information on the Weatherhead 100 in the um, for those that are interested in the chat. I also posted a link to some upcoming events that we have at the Veal Institute. We have a few this week, and then in 2021, um, we'll be back to um, offering a number of other programs. So with that, happy holidays to everybody. Um, Andy, Eric, and Chris, thanks for participating. Marissa, great job moderating, and look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.